I'd like to welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Today is Tuesday, August 15th. We have a call to order. Mr. Kaling? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Mr. Quadro? Present. Dr. Portia Boner? Present. And Mayor Ciara is due in. She walks in, rides with speaking. So. Mm -hmm. Mayor Ciara. Here. Okay. <laughs> no, no need to run. <laughs> Thank you. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Well, I'm going to be struggling here. Got my reading glasses. Okay, mission statement: Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Thank you, excellent. <clears throat> Is there any participation by the public this evening? Hearing none, participation by the trustees? No. Uh, yeah, I do have a little something to say. Well, first of all, uh, we just had our, uh, our building committee meeting for our new building. Um, great conversations going on, really starting to move somewhere. We touched on mechanical systems today, which I thought we had some spirited input on that. And I think all systems need to be evaluated, which uh, we'll get to the bottom of at some point. Um, a lot was said, it was, it was, it was good. And uh, personally, um, I am running for re-election to the Board of Trustees, but somehow I will not be on the ballot due to the fact I neglected to pick up my papers and pass them on down the counter to the next office, which I find that's another story. Um, so I just wanted to go on record that I will be running and will be having to do a write-in campaign. And that's that. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the July 18, 2023 Board of Trustees meeting. Mm -hmm. Second. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And at this time, we have a superintendent's report. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So, to start off, I just want to, uh, you, you're going to see the formatting slightly different. I want to thank Dr. Spencer Robinson uh, working with me over this particular summer. Looking at uh, the report, looking at the evaluation system, as we talked about a couple months ago, uh, the different standards that superintendents are evaluated on. And we agreed that the superintendent report, why shouldn't we model the report? Well, I'm reporting after the board. Let's model it on, on those four particular standards. So you're going to see it broken down to those four particular categories. I think it's going to provide me that framework to, to make my job easier to report to you as a board. Obviously, then at the end of the year, it's going to be a lot easier for myself uh, to provide the evidence to you for the evaluation system. The evidence will be in the reports already. Now, obviously, it'll be easier for you as a trustee, and you can go back to previous minutes and see what we've talked about throughout the year, which directly tie back to those four standards. So you're going to see a slightly different format. Uh, with that said, uh, the first standard is the instructional leadership. Now, over the summer, I, I also talked about uh, maybe a preview into the school year, the upcoming school year, uh, to give the board uh, sort of a high-level insight of you know, what we're preparing for and how we're preparing for the upcoming school year. So last Tuesday, uh, this was a rescheduled re admin retreat, uh, but we were able to come together as a full leadership team, and uh, we spent the day together, uh, full, the, the full morning up to lunchtime, uh, we planned for the year. Uh, went through a lot of different activities and upcoming events and so on and so forth. Uh, but to kick it off, every year we talk about a theme. Uh, it's a chance as a leadership team to come together, uh, sort of center ourselves around whatever that common theme is going to be, 
and then how does that theme then drive throughout the school year? Uh, last couple of years, as, as examples coming out of the pandemic, um, we really felt the pandemic was great. Okay, and within quotation marks here at Smith, I think we did a great job as a staff, as admin, students, and family. We really did come together uh, as one unified team to figure out how we're going to survive through this pandemic, how we're going to educate our students, and we did a great job. Uh, but during that, that two-year span, uh, what really fell by the wayside that we felt coming out of the pandemic was getting back to the basics. Okay, we were sort of solving the world's problems and, and, and building that plane as we are trying to fly it. Let's get back to the basics, back to the teaching and learning. So a couple of years ago, our theme was back to the basics. Uh, last year, going into last year, I, I felt we were all stressed out. Okay, we, we know the, the social emotional uh, toll of the pandemic really impacted the students, it impacted the adults. Uh, I think it still is. Uh, so last year's theme was relationships. Okay, how do we work well together? How do we make sure that the, the relationships that our students have with one another uh, and, and along with the staff, how do we re rebuild some of those relationships and foster those relationships? So that was last year's theme. This summer when I was at uh, down at the Cape for the MASS conference, uh, the theme that uh, they were really pushing was, uh, what is our why? What is your why? Uh, and, and that's W-H-Y, why? What is your purpose? And uh, I played two videos uh, for the leadership team, and I really wanted to, to maybe step out of the comfort zone and uh, share these two videos with the board. Uh, so you, you can sort of see what the leadership team, what we were focusing on last week, um, and that's sort of that what versus why video I'm going to show in a minute. And then the second video is I wanted to show the leadership team my personal why, Andy's why, uh, as the superintendent. And uh, you know, this is sort of the why for all different seasons of our life, uh, all different seasons of our professions, uh, sometimes your why may change, uh, but it's nice to know what your why is. So uh, the first video I'm going to show you can really sort of differentiates what your what is versus what your why is. And as I was talking to the leadership team, we all know what our goal is. Okay, we were hired, uh, the board hired me as the superintendent, the leadership team was hired for whatever role, whatever lane that they're in. And we have a great team here. Uh, and each of them, each of the administrators, they do an outstanding job in that particular lane. So if anybody is, is asked, what do you do? Well, I'm the superintendent, Joe's the principal, and we know what we do. But why do we do what we do? That's the ultimate question. And if you can really define your why, it makes you what much more, I, I believe, uh, so the elevated, clear, people know, and you're going to see in this particular video what happens when you know what your mind is. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie, because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is, is it's me. I travel around the country and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. And in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So we're in Winston-Salem. I'm going to show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience, and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Go ahead. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought a sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Now, 
just to give you the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. because you're walking towards or in your purpose. Thinking about... So we talked about you know, a brief conversation about that difference there. Okay, we are all great administrators here. We have a great school here. Uh, we, know what, we know what we're doing here. Uh, but the more we step into that why, okay, and I'll talk about my why in a moment in the second video, uh, I think it's very obvious as I begin, begin to, to explore my why over the last couple of years, I've seen individuals I shared as with the leadership team. I've had teachers come up to me to talk to me about my why, uh, and we truly have some authentic conversations. Uh, I had a student I was telling, telling the leadership team, uh, there was a student who graduated last year. I always wanted to have a conversation with him, but for whatever reason, we never had the conversation. Uh, I wanted to talk to him because his last name happened to be the last name of one of my high school teachers growing up. I wasn't sure if there was a relationship. <coughs> But we just never had a conversation. Towards the end of the school year, that, that individual came up to me, introduced himself to me, and we actually had a conversation that centered on my why. And we had a great conversation. Because again, the more we lean into why we're doing what we're doing, people see that and pick up on that and they're drawn to that, uh, which will make our jobs that much better and more efficient and just more successful as administrators. Uh, so what is my why? <clears throat> Was he related to your teacher? No. <laughs> uh, they like three uh, so anyways, this why I've sort of queued it up. Uh, what you're going to see is sort of a, a highlight summary of a mission trip that just happened uh, through my church over to Africa. Okay, so you're going to see sort of the highlights of that particular trip. I unfortunately did not go on the trip, okay? But you're going to see somebody in the video who's actually a teacher that we have here, okay? Uh, but what really sparked my interest in this particular video was uh, the lead up to um, this video that happened a couple weeks ago. I saw through social media a lot of photos that were being taken from people that were on the trip. They were posting pictures on social media, on, on Facebook and Instagram and so on and so forth. And what I saw was, it's a slum in Kenya. That's where they're at. Okay, it's a really bad slum. And you're going to see the video. The, the pain and the suffering and, and just the it's just, it's awful. Okay, the living environment is awful. There's no way around it. You know, how could anybody be happy in such, a, such an environment? But then you see the joy and the love and the happiness on the kids' faces in the school that you're going to see. Uh, it perplexed me. I couldn't figure out how students that, that young going through hell, basically, how could they be happy in the school? Uh, I just couldn't figure it out. And uh, this video really begins to dive into uh, why that happens. And then I actually spoke to Ray, who's our teacher. You'll see him in the video I saw this past weekend. And I asked him, I said, that it shocked me to see how these kids could be so happy in that school in Andy. That's the only place they have. They took trips out into the houses, into the, into the slums, literally the slums. And he's an electrician by trade, and there's no electricity over there. Uh, but, but anyways, he was saying, Andy, like, it's so much despair in the slums, in that, in that community. You have these kids sitting in trash and in urine and feces and so on and so forth and bugs are crawling all over them 
Uh, there is no joy, there's no smiling, there's nothing in Islam. But when those kids get into that school, that's where the smiles come out. That's where that joy is. Uh, I see that a lot here at Smith, okay? <laughs> we have a lot of students who have basically nothing at home, okay? Uh, we talk about the stu our student demographics, we talk about the, the socioeconomic status of a lot of our students. Uh, when they come to Smith, they find joy, they find connection, they find an opportunity. And, and one of our slogans here at Smith is opening doors of opportunity. Uh, you're going to see this school is situated within a wall, okay? It sort of barricades itself from outside the, the slum. And they talk about opening up the door and the joy that they hear. So, you know, and we talk about opening doors for our students. They literally open up the door so the kids can come in. Uh, and I think we see that a lot when our students, I had you know, a, a couple of kids, I'm not going to talk about kids here, but they had nothing, they had no hope, they, you know, and they come in during a shop break or they come into the cafeteria and they sit on the stage and we talk to them and, you know, one particular student I'm thinking about has lost his father, uh, he has uh, just nothing really to live for. And he comes here and he interacts with the adults because we are basically his role models, uh, you know, we are his hope. Uh, and I see this over and over and over again here at Smith, uh, the success stories, uh, students who really had no hope until they came to Smith and we, we trained them, we gave them the skill. Uh, they, they finally uh, had some academic success. We hear that over and over again, how they hated middle school, they hated elementary school, and then they come to Smith and you know, the doors are open, and no pun intended. So I saw a lot of similarities between Smith and what you're going to see here. And uh, you know, so I, I felt I wanted to share this with, the, with my admin team because I feel this a lot. Okay? Uh, I see this a lot with our students, I see this a lot with our staff. On the flip side, we're all stressing out, okay? We're, we're still coming out of the pandemic and that stress level is still at an all-time high. And I'm seeing that uh, amongst the adults. And I wanted this video to be a reminder that no matter how difficult our day is, it can always be more difficult, okay? If we're having a bad day at work, uh, somebody else is having a worse day, okay? So it just gives me a new, fresh sort of perspective on life. Um, but these kids and the motivation to, to save one kid and here at Smith to help one kid graduate and have hopefully that door opened and have success in life, that's my why, okay? Uh, and I told my admin team when I worked at previous schools, a traditional high school, oftentimes as a school counselor or, or an administrator, most of the kids thought it was their birthright to get a high school diploma. That's just what they do, okay? They never thought about the challenge it is to earn a high school diploma. A lot of, of our students here at Smith, they realize it's not a birthright. They have to, they have to work for it. And I really do value that, and that, that sort of motivates me to be here at Smith. So, with that said, I'm going to show you this video, at least part of it. <clears throat>
My name is TV Lochiem. I grew up in Kibera. My name is Molly Rode. I'm from West Hampton, Massachusetts. I'm Ray Racine. I'm from South Hadley, originally from Chicory. I'm Eddie Wangi. I was born and raised here in Kibera, so I've lived here my entire life. My name is Zita, and I'm from Belcher Town. So, my name is Fidel Muyendo. I come from the uh, western part of Kenya, but let's say born and bred in Nairobi. I'm 29 years old, and uh, I'm I am an employee of uh, Acacia Tree Lodge. I came in uh, 2017, around May. We were just, uh, let's say, 10 people. Yes. Uh, four guys from uh, Kibera and uh, around seven guys from uh, Brackenest. So we were to engage ourselves, let's say, share ideas on what you can do to bring up Acacia. Educational academics is taken in the US, but in Kenya it's really a big thing. Stephen over here is one of the few people in our family that has graduated. This is a really big deal. It was a big deal for me, big deal for us because I am the first one in our family, so I had to set that example for all of them. I have brother Collins and my two sisters. And uh, keeping in mind that you are coming in from Kibera, even the university or the high school that we went in through, they were like, no, oh, you're coming from Kibera. No, we don't want to associate with you because your people had already, already red zoned Kibera that these are really bad people coming in from Kibera. No matter what you hear or see on TV, doesn't prepare you for seeing it in person and realizing this is how they live. Yeah, meeting Eddie and Maxwell was is amazing, uh, and their mom, what an incredible story they have. But realizing and seeing their home and realizing they've lived there for over 30 years is, I, it's just, the whole thing is humbling. I'm not from Kibera, so the way I interacted with them, people from Kibera, I realized there is more than just a job. If you are out of Kibera, let's say, you don't realize how life is, because you, you might take life for granted until you find that person who you can engage with, you realize that you should appreciate life. You should also thank God with what you have. When I was growing up, all this time I've stayed in Nairobi and never entered Kibera. Yes. So outside me, there is usually a perception about Kibera, you know, the gangs, uh, let's say diseases, the crowded place, the, the, the slum in general. I had never stepped in Kibera, even my friends, no one knew about, let's say, Kibera in town. It's difficult to see. I, watching videos or looking at pictures doesn't do it justice. Walking and, and seeing what they live through and surviving in and what they don't have, what I take for granted, is worlds apart. We got to tour one home, and it looked, and it's probably a, one of the nicer homes here. I can't put the words. They have another level of respect that I give them that their daily life is just to get to the next day. Yeah, so it's, it's such a mix of emotions because it's such joy. Like, while I'm there is pure happiness and joy. Every once in a while, I catch myself, like, thinking about what's actually going on right now. I'm like, cheer up, but then it's like, no. 
these kids just need me right now to be present, be here with them. So when I came to Acacia, you know, uh, we engaged with uh, my friends. They also took me there for the first time. Yes. And I could see what they were going through. They said they took me inside Kibera. <laughs> the first day I was a bit scared or let's say nervous because still my perception was about missing the guns. I mean, you can't, uh, they might rob me. But I found amazing people, you know, very friendly, and I've realized the, uh, the stories that they give outside there is not really inside. So when we come to Acacia, you see, let's say, you will see someone who's who slept hungry the other night, but when he's at work, you see him smiling every day, and you're like, how do you do that? I got curious of what you should do, uh, what they were doing, and you'll find uh, him or her telling me that uh, he slept hungry, maybe he was reading the Bible through the night, asking God why this happened to me. So they will give me, let's say, Bible verses, what really transform their lives, what maneuvered them from the tough challenges of what they were going through. That's the thing, like I didn't really know what to expect. Like I knew I would be emotional and it would be hard. Like I knew that. Today when we were leaving, I saw two of my eighth graders who I know, Vivian and Celeste, we were leaving on the bus and he had gone out to the end to like wave at us. I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen, knew that he did that. And I looked out and I saw him. So I leaned over and waved at him. And when he saw me, he had the biggest smile. And he waved back. But we're driving away, leaving him while he's standing on the dirt, surrounded by trash, and he can't leave. I can't imagine like being in their shoes. And then just coming to school. And especially the older kids, like the amount of pressure they have on them. They know their only way out is to do well in school. You have to pass this test in eighth grade in order to get into high school. But not only do you have to get into high school, you have to pay for high school. And most of those kids can't pay for high school unless someone helps them. Actually, I don't think any kid in Kibera can pay for high school. Making out and seeing my life outside Kibera was nearly impossible. It was just a, a mere dream. I'm the eldest son in my family. So I had to take my father's role at some point. So it was, it was difficult and the thank God for New Hope. New Hope came with a program that took kids to high school to receive high school education. So I was among the first beneficiaries it was a second chance given to us through New Hope Initiative. So through education, that's where I am right now. The hope that New Hope brought, that's what's keeping me moving now. So I was obviously working in a school back home. I was beyond excited to come and meet these kids and the teachers too here. Um, and when the bus pulled up and we got off the bus and I could hear the kids but we couldn't see them, we were beyond that gate. And my stomach did a flip just hearing the kids' voices and the gates opened and the kids were there and the singing and the greeting and I thought, they're so happy to see us. There was so much love and joy, which I had been told about but I wasn't prepared to experience it myself. And so as we went up the stairs and kept on going and the singing continued, by the time we reached the roof deck, I couldn't breathe. I, I was so overtaken with the sheer joy and the smiles on their faces and thought, just take it in. Don't, don't let your mind go anywhere else right now. Just be here, present in this moment and take this in because you may never experience something quite like this ever again. My biggest moment so far was getting off the bus and, and waiting on the other side of that green door, just hearing hearing the joy, the laughter, the excitement, and for what? For us, for me. And then we opened that door. Nothing in the world prepared me for the joy, the laughter, the love, the excitement that they had for us, for me. This was like the celebration that I've never seen for anything that they were celebrating us coming to 
they don't even know what we were here for. And that was amazing. The kids are so happy. And we can't imagine being happy in that situation. Which I think partially is why it's so sad for us. Because it's like how it makes us look at ourselves to be like, if they are so happy with nothing and we're miserable, well, something's going on here. Something doesn't make sense. And then it makes us feel almost like projecting onto them. Like that you should be miserable because I would be miserable if I was you. But then I think I was missing the part where like they had those relationships. So we are actually missing something that they have. There are two important days in someone's life. The day that you're born and the day that you realize why you're born. So I really think that it's a good thing if everyone So we played that and, and it ended it on that, I thought it was a perfect cue, you know, uh, when, when you realize why you were born, you know, what your purpose is, uh, it just makes everything much clearer and you had that motivation and uh, I think, you know, when I start the, the school year and I know that we have students coming here, nothing like you here, okay, uh, but they're coming here needing that hope, they're needing that opportunity, they need our teachers and they, and they need the administrative staff to be present, you heard that many times, you just have to be present for the students. Molly was saying, you know, the one thing that we offer this year is those relationships. Uh, we have to be here for those, those students. And uh, oftentimes in life here in the U.S., we, we fail to recognize the small things in life. Uh, so we're going to have tough days this year, okay? Um, whatever that, it, that the issue is, whether it's a student issue, a facility issue, a budget issue in the springtime, whatever the issue causes stress, uh, I, I think if I can just hit the pause button and step back and say, this is why I'm here. Uh, is to help those students who need us uh, more so than a traditional school. So that's why I love this school. Uh, that's why I love being here, working with our staff. I've said this from day one. Uh, our staff are probably the most logical, down-to-earth individuals who know how to engage students. And I watched this video, and now I understand why I say that. Uh, because our, our staff know uh, what is important here. Uh, to make those connections with the students, making sure they, they receive the education, not only on the, on the academic side, but related back to the, the shops. Provide a skill, provide a real world opportunity, and then see the kids graduate, and then the kids don't want to leave. You know, they always want to come back. Uh, but then they get the jobs, and then they get involved in advisories. And we talked about when we go on the road show, and you know, our our graduates get into the, the communities and become the, the taxpayers. So you see the cycle that happens here at Smith in, in the vocational world that often doesn't happen in the traditional school setting. So uh, I just applaud the school, I applaud the admin team. Uh, if anybody is questioning what my why is, that video just highlighted that why. So. That was uh, the admin retreat. <clears throat> Moving on, the other aspect of instructional leadership, uh, just, again, just planning, planning ahead and looking ahead. Uh, next week, if you can believe our summer vacation is just about done, uh, but next Thursday, all staff return, uh, and Joe will be, will be leading the annual convocation. Again, a chance to kick off, start the year on the, on the right foot, talk about the theme, making sure the staff are ready. I think it's really going to be a, a great start to hopefully another great school year. <clears throat> so the second standard uh, is the management and operations. So for this month, I just went around with, with Joe yesterday, took several photos. Uh, I'm not sure how Tim is even here and still standing. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see over the next several slides, took more than one slide to highlight just a small slice of what's happening here on campus. These pictures were yesterday, okay, and I'm not a great photographer, so I cannot capture truly what is happening in some of these areas. I just want you to realize this is yesterday. We have new staff here next Wednesday. We have all staff <coughs> here next Thursday. We have new students here for orientation next Friday. School begins less than two weeks from today. And you're going to see what's happening here on campus. Uh, it's quite incredible. Uh, a little nerve-wracking, and I can't even imagine how things are. So on the left-hand side, I, I do want to thank uh, the city for helping us out with the, the air conditioning project for C building. Uh, we're moving right along. So that's one of the split units for the classrooms in C building. So again, the goal being, as you all know, 
and we'll have air conditioning in all of the academic classrooms to see them. In the middle, uh, this was me uh, using the fob at the, the main entrance here in A building. <clears throat> so what you're looking at in that main picture there, that contraption at the top, okay, there's a camera, and so that way uh, a visitor, a guest, a vendor, whoever does not have a fob, you know, they, as most schools, they hit the button, it will appear in the main office, and they'll be able to uh, access the door and allow the visitors in. That bottom contraption, the middle contraption where my fob is, my hand is, uh, this is what we will be receiving. It's a typical fob, okay? It's high, each of us are identified, uh, so we can see who's going where and when. Uh, we have different categories set up, but uh, as staff will have that, students will have that, and they can fob in, they can access the door, the door will unlock, you can open the door and gain access to the buildings. And then the bottom uh, is the ADA push button for anybody who uh, needs assistance to open the door. And again, they are tied together. That was one of our questions during the early part of the project. Uh, you can't just simply hit the ADA button and the door is not going to automatically open. You, you need to have access via the, the fob. So the security measurement is still there. Uh, this is, again, through the main doors throughout campus. Uh, the categories that we have set up already, and we had a great discussion at the leadership team uh, last week. Right now, we have three categories. We may have to add a fourth, uh, depending on what they can, like the cleaning service and you know, other groups. Uh, but the three main groups that we have right now is the student population, the staff faculty population, and administration population. So in essence, administrators would have access 24-7, 365 if they wanted to come in. Uh, there's discussion about how this fob could actually activate or deactivate an alarm in the building. It could all be tied together. <coughs> Students would have access to the buildings, certain buildings, certain times of the day, school year. Okay, And staff would have a similar setup, but a longer day. They'd have access to buildings longer in the evening, uh, but again, only certain days. So staff can't simply come in over the summer or weekends and things like that. Uh, so I'm very excited with this. I know uh, this was a concern that came up to the teachers. It's been a concern on our radar for, for quite a while. Uh, so thankfully, we're finally at the point where we can begin to provide some more security. It's not a totally locked down campus. There will never be a locked down campus. I think as a vocational school, you can just think of the bay doors being open. Uh, but we are definitely moving in the right direction. The right-hand side, I, I want to thank Joe with his vision. Uh, this is truly a, a testament to us as an agricultural school. When you think of a farm, you think of split rail fencing. Uh, so this is a project that uh, we've empowered the summer horticulture crew over the last several years. They try to take on a, a, a project to beautify the campus. This summer, they've been able to hopefully complete in the next couple of days the split rail fencing along the nine. If you haven't had a chance to see it, you know, please stop and, and look at it. I think it really highlights what we do here. And back to the why, why we're here. We're here for the agricultural programs. <clears throat> so this is where, how is it going to get done for day one? I, I can't answer that question. On the left-hand side, uh, this is the culinary hood project. Uh, <clears throat> so if you walk into the kitchen, this is our chapter 74 culinary program. It looks like a bottle now, to be perfectly honest. I'm not sure if it looks any better today, Tim, does it? A little bit. A little bit, okay. <laughs> uh, this is way overdue. Uh, we've had to have the, the system. Yeah, I joked in the past, the fire department became best friends with us. Yeah, anytime we were like, doing hamburgers or bacon or whatever, you know, the alarms would go off because we couldn't filter out uh, the smoke well enough. So hopefully, relatively soon, that will be put back together. We're gonna have state-of-the-art hood systems in there. And uh, we'll be able to teach and, and operate much nicer. Uh, so, anyways, we're getting it. the middle picture is going to be Mr. LaRoe's new office. Again, as a reminder, uh, I want to thank the board for allowing through the budget process to expand our leadership team. Uh, so, actually, Josh Clark, our new assistant principal, is in the peanut gallery. Uh, we wanted to, to see how uh, these meetings run. So, by hiring Josh, uh, we knew the space was limited, and we knew uh, the priority was in the main office office really should have the building-based administration, so the principal and the two assistant principals. Uh, so that has happened. That meant uh, Ms. Chartier, vocational director, had to move out. Uh, so she has moved into Mr. LaRoe's current office uh, in B building, which makes a lot of sense. She will now be immersed into the, the vocational programs will be around here, just like Mr. Parks as the academic coordinator is immersed in C building, the academic classroom. So it makes a lot of sense organizationally. Uh, but we needed a new home for Mr. LaRoe. <coughs> So this space used to be the storage closet for Park and Rec. Uh, we are working on 
new space to store other than the parking rack material and supplies. Right now it's in the back hallway. That closet is being renovated, as you can see, it's almost done uh, into an office. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's looking great. And uh, Jeff will be in there uh, before you know it. On the right hand side, that picture is the collision um, related classroom. So the floor was stripped down. Uh, the walls were repainted, uh, new ceiling being put in, the LED lighting being put in. It's going to match. If you went through that door on the opposite wall there that you see, if you walk through that door, that's the automotive related space, uh, which was redone last year through the Skills Capital Grant. We thought through equity, it made a lot of sense that the collision uh, related should match, at least be uh, on par with automotive. Uh, so when I walked through yesterday, uh, Tim and his crew, you can kind of see they were doing the, the epoxy flooring, the kickboard all the way around. Is it done today? No, we got a coat tomorrow and a coat Thursday and we should be out of there. So you'll see in a future picture, you'll see a similar floor, okay? But it's that epoxy flooring that we're doing really throughout campus. It looks beautiful, it's more durable. Uh, so it's gonna look great when it's all done. Uh, so that's collision to related room that will be done, hopefully relatively soon. On the left hand side, uh, the foundation has been poured, the pad has been poured. This is going to be the new companion animal building. That's where our canines will be for kenneling and grooming and whatnot. Uh, in the background, you can see the truss system. All the trusses are on site. In the MS barn, right, rather than storing a lot of animals at the moment, we're storing a lot of the build building material for this particular structure. Uh, so I, I hope, honestly, and I think what we, we talked about as a board was we were going to have this building enclosed over the summer. It's obviously not enclosed, uh, but we will be working on that. And then with the students back on campus, they're going to be able to work on the inside to do a lot of the interior work when it comes to plumbing, electrical, and carpentry. Uh, so that, that would be wonderful when we had that building up and running and really expand our, our, our animal science program like we've been talking about for the last several years. With that said, the middle picture uh, with the, the green walls, that was formerly the uh, the animal science related classroom. That's sort of the annex off of the MS bar. And uh, as you know, when we took back the GCC building, we renovated that building last year. That's now the animal science related classrooms. That allowed us to get the students out of that space uh, as far as a related classroom, which has allowed us to do now what you see on the right hand side of that picture. That's the interior picture, uh, the interior space of that same building. That's going to become the pocket pet lab. That's where the gerbils and the rabbits and the snakes and all the other fun small animals that you <coughs> see uh, will be stored uh, in that new lab. Uh, you can see that floor, that's the epoxy floor uh, I'm referring to. Uh, so it's the gray with the, the speckle uh, in there. Uh, so a beautiful new space. You can see the outside, we're redoing the, the siding. Uh, when we tore into it, the rodents had basically chewed through all of the installation. It, it was not a pretty site. So thank you to Tim and his crew. Totally redid the exterior walls. Uh, we insulated uh, and we do the interior, so it will be great for our students. Uh, so, a lot rodents of work there. are the pocket pets, right? These are different rodents? Correct. <laughs> rodents have a lot. Yes, a Feral. In the last two photos, uh, we talked about you know, the Apple storage, okay? Uh, that's the former name of that storage barn you see on the left hand side. We had a lot of rot in the sill work, uh, so you've heard reports over the past several months. We're basically at the final stage of wrapping up that particular project. Uh, you can see those four bays are typically assigned to different shops. That's where they can store a lot of the material and supplies. Uh, and then underneath that, on the back side is the, the pasture. You can see from the nine. Underneath that is sort of a, a storage area, sort of housing area for, for some of our animals. And fire. So uh, as you can see, that's, that's nearing completion as well. And on the right hand side, uh, you've heard a lot of stories and, and feedback about the stormwater system. Uh, thank you to the city for wrapping this particular project up. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, noticed this if you're uh, driven by on Route 9, uh, but that's the new swale that was put in uh, sort of on that front corner of the campus, uh, looking down into the pasture. Uh, so keep our fingers crossed uh, that the engineers uh, did the calculations correctly and, and we can sort of mitigate the stormwater uh, as appropriate. So the questions about some of the projects? I know Tim's going to be forwarding a little bit, but I just want to visually for the board to see what's happening on campus. And again, this is yesterday, and we're going to people on campus next week, so there'll be a lot happening over the next week, week and a half. Pictures are such a good idea. I appreciate you having to see it. 
no pictures for this one, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a horticulture building update. Uh, just briefly, uh, as Mr. Quadro said, we met again as the full building committee. We are really eyeball deep into the design phase of this. Uh, small revisions here and there, uh, but the basic concept is still there. Okay, mm -hmm. having uh, the classroom space and the shop space. Uh, the, the idea right now is it's going to be built on the back side of the football field. Uh, so we are still on that path. Uh, right now, the, the big holdup right now uh, is various testing that we have to have. Uh, soil testing and whatnot, water testing uh, to make sure that we have clean soil uh, and we're able to appropriately build on it. So uh, there's some hole up there in trying to get the contracts in, in place and getting the engineers out. But once that's done, then we can really get into the, the final stages of the initial design so that we can go out to hopefully in September or October uh, go out to the cost estimator and get a cost estimate of this building. And that's obviously going to be you know, with the conversation that really is driven. Uh, can we afford this? If we can't, how do we afford it? There's a great conversation today about uh, potential uh, grants or, or other subsidies out there. Uh, there's possibilities around donations, around building material. Uh, so there are some opportunities, but I will be honest. I've been honest from day one. I, I am worried about the overall cost and how we close this gap. So uh, that fear has not gone away. If anything, it's only increased over the last couple of months, to be honest. So that's where we are there. It's all of our problem. Yes. The third standard is family and community engagement. So with that sort of overall umbrella, just want to remind the, the board, I think I already mentioned it, next Friday uh, is the new student orientation uh, where and we'll be welcoming all incoming freshmen, along with sophomores, juniors who might be coming in as new students as well. We welcome them with the families. Uh, so it's a wonderful morning where we have a chance to do some short presentations. The students are able to go out and do a tour of the campus. They're able to follow their actual schedule, so they're able to orient themselves to the academic classes. Uh, while that's happening, the families are back with us, and we're talking more, more detail about, uh, from the family perspective, you know, what can they expect, and, and goddess will speak, and, and so on and so forth. So that's next Friday. Another task uh, that I had with, with the leadership team last week at the, at the retreat, uh, back to one of my goals is the newsletter, and really trying to identify various focus areas that the newsletter can focus on uh, throughout the year. And, and my vision is my entry into the newsletter, I really want it to be informative, educational, uh, I give the, the community something to learn about, whether it's specific about Smith, whether it's more about vocational ed in general, Whatever that topic happens to be, I want it to be informative. And then the rest of the newsletter can sort of drill down into the details and have other administrators or other stakeholders here at school provide some of the details about what's happening here at school. So we had a great activity of just brainstorming. This is no particular order. This is not a chronological order. This is not a priority list. Uh, but it's just a list of topics that you may see in my newsletters throughout the year. Uh, there's, I think, 15. There's only 10 newsletters, so you know, obviously some of these topics may not happen this year. They may happen the following year. But uh, I want to thank the, leader, the leadership team, you know, brainstorming some, I think, viable, valid, uh, and very valuable uh, topics that we can talk about for our families. So that's going to really expand on that feeling and the engagement aspect. A couple of updates. One was, uh, I believe it was last week or the week before, I had a telephone conversation with the Hatfield Town Administrator, Marlene. Um, she reached out, I think I was down at the Cape, honestly, when, when the communication first happened. So to give the board a little bit of background, Hatfield was contacted uh, by Franklin Tech, up in Franklin County, uh, wondering if Hatfield wanted to become a member of Franklin County Tech. Now, to know your geography, Hatfield is not in Franklin County. Hatfield is in Hampshire County. Uh, Hatfield, when it comes to enrollment, Hatfield sends one to two students a year to Franklin Tech. Last school year and this school year coming up, uh, we are anticipating 20 students from Hatfield. So the vast majority of students who go to a vocational school from Hatfield come here to Smith. So anyhow, Hatfield received the invitation to become a full member of Franklin Tech. Uh, Marley was doing due diligence. She spoke to her superintendent in Hatfield who recommended that she speak to me. So she reached out, we spoke, we had a great conversation. It was more around uh, education, honestly, about what a school membership, okay, that regional agreement would look like for Hatfield if they bought into Franklin Tech. I explained that we don't really have a regional agreement here at Smith. We 
they have a, we have a school of preference uh, that's a state regulation that they could pursue. And I talked about the pros and cons of both. Uh, the biggest thing that um, I think would be eye opener from our lead, from the Hatfield perspective, was that if they became a member of Franklin Tech, they then are part of the whole capital improvement expense ownership of anything that happens at Franklin Tech would be on the hook. That never occurred in that conversation initially. We talked about uh, the conversation as a board a few years ago. There was another community that, that reached out to us asking about a school of preference. As a board, uh, you voted on providing a, a reduced rate of the non-resident tuition rate if that community declared Smith Vocational their school of preference. I shared all of that with, with Marlene. She was very happy to hear that. We talked about transportation. We talked about a lot. Uh, I think she can be more informed not to not go back to the select board and discuss options. So I'm just letting the board know, you know there was that initial conversation, nothing was promised. I think but at least now Marlene knows the pros and cons. Um, and I'll keep the board updated. So. Also, there's a room here at the school named after their town. <laughs> yes. And, and the founder of our school. <laughs> so I, yes. Um, so it was very polite, professional, uh, but very initial, just answering a lot of questions and giving her a lot of information. To be looking at that sign, thinking, well, we have to take it down. <laughs> uh, the second bullet I've been meaning to update the board over the last couple of months. I'm sure Tim can give more details. Uh, but Tim was approached by this is the butterfly. Which group approached uh, you? The Energy, um, Energy Commission. Yeah. The Energy Commission from, this, from the city. Yeah. Energy and Sustainability Commission. Yeah reached out to see if, if we would have some plot of land that we could sort of dedicate uh, induced seeding of some type of wild flower that attracts butterflies. It would be, in essence, become a butterfly habitat. And we talked about the, the field, that one of the fields that we have up by the VA property. Uh, so we've agreed. Uh, so it's very minimal impact on us and our operations. Tim and his crew were, were able to go in and, and plow and seed. Uh, so again, as you're driving along Route 9 at some point, uh, you may see some beautiful flowers and, and wonder why and well, they're attracting the butterflies. Uh, so just letting the board know. Uh, we actually haven't plowed it yet. It's, okay. been, it's been too wet to go in there. So as soon as it dries out. Add to the list. Yep. I'm wondering if that's connected to the horticulture curriculum at all. It seems like the potential may be right by thinking about the like, landscape management and design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that field incorporating more sustainable kinds of practices. So they go up there, right? They do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to make sure the horticulture changes now. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another community outreach project that we have. So the third standard is professional culture. So just a couple highlights over the past month. Uh, the one, uh, a lot of the administrators attended the annual MAVA planning retreat down at Devon's. I just wanted to highlight some of the keynote speakers. Uh, a lot of that planning retreat is just a chance as administrators and colleagues within the vocational world across the state to come together and just collaborate and consult and talk about best practices and, and make sure that we're, again, nobody's alone. And we're all in it together and sharing ideas. But these were the, the major keynote speakers. We had the Education Secretary Tutwiler who was there to kick off. Uh, as I've said several times, whenever he speaks, he's just, he's fabulous uh, when he speaks and he listens. The, the next morning we had Commissioner Riley, and that's sort of an annual okay, thing that he'll always show up and give some high level updates from, from Desi. Uh, really nothing too new, uh, but uh, sort of the, the discussion around MCAS okay, uh, is, is still a topic, it's not still a topic, it's becoming a hot topic, what it may look like. Uh, both individuals, I think, respect vocational ed. They understand our hands-on, our engaging uh, model. Uh, we don't want to get away from that and how can we highlight that more. The first afternoon, uh, BPS is Boston Public School. Uh, their new superintendent, Skipper, uh, joined us via Zoom and we sort of had a, there was a presentation that Boston Public Schools gave the, the administrators and it became a, sh a short Q&A. Uh, the focus was uh, through many, many, many years in political turnover within the city. Uh, Madison Park, which happens to be their vocational school, uh, it sounds like there's some some political buy-in and potentially some financial buy-in uh, to really revamp uh, Madison Park, basically rebuild it. Uh, so the, so the, uh, the superintendent was talking about that process, what that may look like, the amount of money that uh, Boston, as an individual city, has verbally promised EPS in updating a lot of the schools. 
Uh, they're talking over a billion dollars, okay, as a city, reinvesting in the school. So uh, if I ask for a million or two from the mayor, it's not a billion, so <laughs> okay. Uh, correct. Yes. Uh, but the billion isn't for that one school. The billion is for all of the school. Okay, so. She was speaking to the... To Her for, focus yeah. was on that. That was the audience. And then lastly, uh, Skills USA, uh, the executive director spoke. Uh, again, it was a great, it was a long presentation, but it was a long presentation because Skills, uh, as we all know as a board, uh, they do wonderful things. Uh, and there's some wonderful opportunities that our students are able to engage in and experience because of Skills USA. So those were the four main uh, keynote speakers uh, a couple weeks ago. Back to the admin retreat, this was another activity uh, that as the leadership team we went through, and I wanted to highlight with the, the board. <coughs> One of my goals was, again, to do a better job reporting to the board what's happening here on campus. So rather than the week before a board meeting, trying to figure out what department or what activity would be uh, showcased as the school spotlight, we thought it would make a lot more sense. Let's just map it out. Uh, that would provide that particular shop or academic area or student activity plenty of time to plan rather than three or four days. Uh, so we sort of brainstormed uh, knowing the, the typical calendar. So in September, you can expect adult dead. October, you can expect art. Perhaps we can open it up more to communities in general. November would be FFA. December would be the health assisting program. January would be English. February would be athletics slash co-op. March would be animal science. April would be engineering slash physics. May would be skills USA. In June, depending on the year, uh, depending on the end of the year, uh, the snow days, but right now we've penciled in plumbing and electrical. Uh, so just to kind of give the board an update, we wanted to have a more diverse offering. It seems like we've been focusing a lot on the vocational side. Uh, with these presentations, I want to make sure that the board realizes, besides Mike Parks, he does a wonderful job with the NCAS analysis and overview. But really, really want to get, you know, dig down more and get some of the academic departments in front of you to talk about what happens uh, with the academics here on campus. So a lot of planning going on over the summer. Donations, there were none to report for this past month. In the news, I know you can't read this article, but this was an article, I think it was above the fold actually, uh, in the Gazette a few weeks ago about the new health center, uh, sort of revitalized, okay? Uh, the Hilltown Health Network, uh, they did receive some more funding. Still not enough funding uh, to build a building, but uh, there was a wonderful article. Uh, the reporter reached out to me as well, so uh, if you haven't had a chance, I can send it to you if you want. Uh, but again, it's, it's still out there. We definitely want to have that. It would be a great addition to our school and our campus. And I feel it could be a great addition to the community. Mm -hmm. Looking ahead, I kept this sort of as a template, not to re review as a, as a summary, a very boring summary, a summary to the board. I wanted to give the board an update of what might be happening uh, over the next month or so. Um, so we have these weekly horticulture building check-in meetings on Tuesday. You'll see that on this particular slide. I've already mentioned. Uh, next Wednesday is the new staff orientation. Then Thursday through Saturday, so basically all of next weekend, uh, the administrators will be staffing the coming to the fair. So if you have a chance, nothing better to do, stop by the coming to the fair and see us. Uh, we have Thursday is the all staff uh, report back. That's their convocation day. Friday is new student orientation. We've talked about all of that. You go home for the weekend. Again, the administrators are working that weekend uh, up at Covington Fair. We come back on that Monday, that's the first day of school. Uh, again, more horticulture check-in meetings on that Friday, September 1st. This is a contractual obligation. Uh, there's no school on that Friday uh, to provide staff and students the extended Labor Day weekend holiday break. That's also the Three County Fair weekend, uh, opening up on Friday night. Friday night, if you stop by the Three County Fair, you will see administrators staffing the barn. And then the rest of the weekend, Saturday through Monday, uh, we actually pay staff to be there. Uh, so we'll have a representation in the barn throughout the weekend if you want to go and stop by. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to showcase the school. I mentioned Monday is Labor Day. There's no school. Campus is closed. More check-in meetings with the horticulture uh, subcommittee. <clears throat> Friday the 8th is the first Connecticut Valley Steering uh, Superintendent Roundtable. That's CBSR their monthly luncheon uh, at the Laney House. And in September, uh, we'll have Commissioner Riley out here to, again, give some updates from Desi. We have a faculty meeting. We're checking meetings for horticulture. Just an update for the community. Uh, Wednesday, 
September 13th is the first early release. Uh, that's where the students go home early, and then we have the afternoon dedicated for professional development for our staff. Uh, so that's the first one of the year. Department head meeting, no school. Uh, I just found out today, um, you may want to discuss this as a board, I'm not sure how this would go over, but when we approved the, uh, the, the calendar, uh, we penciled in September 19th as primary day. Uh, we typically host elections here on campus, so we've already uh, closed school for that particular day. There's a, an agenda item later this evening that we'll talk about. Maybe this becomes a, a discussion. I'll leave it up to the board. But right now, there's no school primary election day, even though there's no primary. Um, that same evening will be the next month's full building committee for the horticulture rebuild, and then it's the next full board meeting on that same day. So with that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thanks, <clears throat> Yes, good evening. Uh, just a quick update. I, I'll make the changes for you, Deb, but it looks like I didn't properly update that first line. But our current enrollment for the 23-24 school year is 579 with 462 tuitions. Currently we sit at 148 ninth graders that have registered, 27 from Northampton. Uh, we have verbal commitments, which uh, guarantee we're gonna be at the 150. We're waiting for paperwork and things to come in. Um, if there's spots available, we'll continue to move down that wait list. Uh, opening school update. So the new staff orientation is gonna be next Wednesday, August 23rd. We have six new staff members. Um, one, because of the addition into animal science, where we had an instructor move out of AGMEC over, uh, and one due to retirement. So really, it's very low turnover this year, four members. One we lost in January uh, when they took the vocational director's job at, in Holyoke. So um, three new staff members uh, basically is the net. Pretty, pretty good, two of which we hired in May of last year and they came in for the last month of school but they are still going to come through the new staff orientation on Wednesday. So very low turnover this year. Uh, convocation, as Dr. Lincoln Elker said, that's on Thursday the 24th. Uh, we'll present on some updates and uh, key highlights for the month of September um, as well as staff will be released to their areas in the afternoon to prepare. A new student orientation will be on Friday morning. Uh, August 25th, that will take place in our gymnasium. Uh, students will tour. Uh, there's a remainder of students that still need to take the math uh, placement exam. That helps us make sure that we get them the right level, as you're aware, with 150 students coming from 60 different communities. Uh, math can mean different things in different places, so really trying to help uh, get them in the proper level of math. So we have some students that will finish up taking that. We're about uh, we're about 70% of students have taken the exam, so the remaining will take it after their tours and after they go through their uh, schedule on that day, giving time for our school counselors to make adjustments and shift things. <clears throat> First day of school is August 28th. Uh, Dr. Linger Hoker talked about the FOBs. We'll distribute the FOBs to freshmen on that Friday when they're here, and we'll distribute the FOBs to everyone else on Monday morning with their um, school with their uh, schedules, but the school won't go down fully into operational mode on those fobs until that Tuesday, just to make sure that everybody has everything and uh, they're ready to go. Fair. Question. Yes, sir. Well, I guess I'll wait for Tim's report. Go ahead, Joe. Right. Sorry. Fair staffing. Um, as Dr. Lincoln Oger said, administrators will support the Cummington Fair. Uh, we're all filled up for the Tri-County Fair on Labor Day weekend. And we have assigned the administrator on duty for that weekend will be our technology director, Josh Shear. Uh, our final hire was our PE teacher that took place in between the July meeting and this meeting. So we are fully staffed, which is a good thing. Uh, pending your questions, that's my report. Uh, you made, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You made a comment, 60 different communities. Is that accurate? Yeah. The sending districts or approximately I have to go through and look but it's generally falls between 56 and 62 63 in a given year I don't have the exact number for this yeah. coming year so we're fully staffed 
this far before the start of school. It's fantastic. Um, I can't imagine what the average is for the state, but do we know how we compare it to other vocational schools in the state in terms of being fully staffed at this point? I think we are, I, when we went to connect uh, for the MABA planning retreat a um, week and a half ago, I think we're in the minority of schools that are fully staffed. Small percentage. Yeah, I, I would say so. A testament to your leadership, your leadership team, Dr. Lincoln, of course, leadership. People want to work here. Yeah, I think the district has a great reputation right now, and mm -hmm. hopefully we'll keep that going. But yeah, we are definitely in hearing anecdotally from them. They are not fully staffed. Sure. Um, I also have questions about the map placement test. Is it uh, electronic or paper and pencil? It is. It's electronic this year, uh, so it gets graded immediately. Um, in the past, we were doing it in the first couple days of school and then shifting, so it was rather disruptive. Um, the year before Andy and I got here, they were still doing it in the summer. They had a grant to bring teachers in, so uh, we were able to use it. Mike Parks, through uh, one of his grants, was able to use the money for this testing. It's definitely a better model to try to go back to that and get the students in. We offered multiple sessions. So we offered a day on Saturday. We offered in the morning during the week and in the evening during the week to try to try to hit as many opportunities as soon as they come. But still, when they come on that that day next Friday, we'll be able to um, do the hopefully the remainder. If there are student, any students that aren't present, I, mean, I think we'd be able to count on our hand how many students would have to make it up that first day of school. But we'll make so sure everybody's tested. They have to take it in person, but it's great to get like Correct. Yeah, we want them here just to make sure that we know they're the ones taking it. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's a true reflection uh, so that they get properly placed. Do you know where the test comes from? Our staff created the test. Okay. Yeah, our staff created the test um, to highlight the care key areas. Um, so they've been using it and every year they review it and make sure that it's doing what we want it to do. Okay. Um, they then created it using um, just like a Google form. So, it, you know, using Google Classroom to create an exam. So they're able to grade it right away. <clears throat> One change already in reflecting um, is we're going to have we're going to have an additional teacher present mm -hmm. so that we can talk about their results immediately oh. uh, as they go out of it and talk about how they feel they did, their results, where they most likely will be placed. Try to get a better idea of the math that they did so that it just doesn't capture just their performance on that day. More robust. Yeah. Yeah. And what are the plate math placement options for students? So, yeah, in ninth grade, um, they can go into Integrated Math 1, they can go into Algebra, uh, Honors Algebra, or we have been able to add a, um, almost like a pull-out math, where it's a, a teacher so that they have math and special ed. That would be for our media students. It's a we also, co 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 class. It's um, yeah, go ahead. It's inclusion, sorry. It's, it's a push-in, so it's, we have a special ed teacher with a regular ed teacher. And then we also use it um, to look at the MCAS math placement. And do, we, um, do students take any other place, placement tests in any other subjects, or do just in math? Just in math. The other one is optional right now, and that's if they want <coughs> to um, be evaluated for honors English in ninth grade. Because there are a good amount of options in other subject areas. I, I, Right, at least in English and science, or no? Uh, well, science is pretty much dictated by the shop that you go in. So if you're in sort of the um, your health sciences or your um, you know like criminal justice or um, health, culinary, others like that, animal science, you go through the biology track. Okay. If you are in um, manufacturing. Uh, carpentry, cabinet making, plumbing, you go through the physics track. Okay. So we're trying to match your science yeah. to the areas that you're going to be focusing on with your vocational trade. What about Project Lead the Way? Project Lead the Way is in place of the MCAS map in ninth and 10th grade. Okay. So students that place well or, or mm -hmm. want the challenge mm -hmm. can opt into the Project Lead the Way. So during that first period of class on their shop weeks, that's where we do the second uh, class of math. So all students in ninth and 10th grade do get a double English and a double math. Gotcha. It just looks a little different than what the focus is on. Depending on how much support they need. Right. So the, the so the MCAS, the project lead the way in ninth and 10th grade is not in place of your science. Mm -hmm. You're still taking your MCAS science-based class 
biology or physics. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the lead the way is really in place of those 9th and 10th grade MCAS math prep. So for those students, when we talk about kind of meeting students at their level, um, students that are already really great at math and want to move on to challenge themselves have that opportunity to um, challenge themselves and, and then go through the project lead the way. But students can opt in a project lead the way later on. Yeah. So there are available classes in awesome. robotics and engineering yeah. for 11th and 12th grade. It's just fabulous, all the options here. Um, Dr. Lincoln Hooker alluded to, um, you know, the, the elimination of MCAS as a competency determination being a hot topic. And one of the things I think that um, we all will be thinking about is if MCAS is no longer used as a competency determination for graduation, to what extent will we be offering support for the MCAS to our ninth and tenth graders? Like I recognize that. Those uh, the support that we provide has been tremendous for students and mm -hmm. results in really high passing rate for our students. With MCAS taking taking away, what will that look like? What what do we want it to look like? What do we want to do with that instructional time? You know, and how, what aligns with our mission, mm -hmm. our educational mission? So it'll be a big question, I think. Thank you for answering all those questions. Thank you. The report, Tim. Yep. Um, I'll just update kind of what Andy already touched on. So the AC project in C building, the manufacturer of the units should be here tomorrow to start them up and verify they're all working. And then that project will be done. The guys can finish the floors in there. The C building will be done. As bad as the kitchen looks right now, I think by next Wednesday it will be all back together with new lights, new ceiling, Ansel system. If everybody shows up like they say they're gonna, we should be back by next Wednesday. The hole in the kitchen, cafeteria kitchen floor, if we get our plumbing inspector tomorrow who says that the grease trap is good, we can start to backfill that, retile it. Um, the dishwasher that initiated this grease trap is on hold um, by the manufacturer, by the factory. Um, so we'll just have to wait for that, but that should be back in shape. Um, Question. Yep. This is a new occurring problem that just developed recently? No, it was just an uh, upgraded uh, dishwasher, but then when well, you, how buy, you, you trigger oh. new code that makes it have to have its own separate grease trap, Okay. and then an additional right. code that needs it, uh, its own floor sink, too. So, let's see. Uh, auto body should be back by next Tuesday. The classroom, new ceiling put in. Uh, the floor will be done by Friday. The animal science classroom and the MS barn should be all done by Friday. Um, they got a plumber putting in a new water filling station, water bottle filling station in there in the hallway. Um, if the guys can paint that up. Um, I do anticipate four walls and maybe the trusses set before in, in tenants. Um, the, yep. all right, uh, well, sorry. Um, Joe. The, the fob door system during the installation that goes smoothly any major glitches with software technology everything fall into place as far as facilities part no they did they did a nice job um, one transition we did do we were going to use cards but um, um joe decided he wanted to move to the pops so Good. we're in the process um, my staff putting the, the key tags on with the student names that you up to the ninth graders. I thought it was always going to be a FOB. It was going to be a FOB card that we could print their school ID on. Okay. Um, and part of it was, I think it was kind of like a, a hangover idea from when we have initially talked about uh, this about six or seven years ago when it was about three quarters of a million dollars. And there was a technology has certainly improved, and the uh, way that it integrates now is a lot faster. So when we saw it as a, as a building level admin team. We said, what's the pros and cons of all this? And I think t to, to have to reprint ID cards um, yearly, the cost of it, uh, because they become wasted after that, uh, whereas the fobs are interchangeable. You can just wipe them clean, you can reprogram it, and give it to somebody new. Right. Um, and kids change throughout the course of their year. They, they lose them, things like that. So I think when we look at it from a management standpoint or and, and really um, 
when we talk about organizing it, it's, it's far easier to organize the, the fob tags. But yeah, we were thinking about trying to combine because originally the idea was that we would be using a barcode system. We know now technology-wise the barcode system can be faked by, you can just have it on your phone, you can take a picture of it, you can whatever. It's not secure anymore. It's, the technology is far beyond it. So mm -hmm. they were going to be fob cards similar to like you might get at a hotel. Uh, you touch the door and they yeah. go off. So we're not going to be using that technology part of it. But yeah, Crystal was able to make that change and the vendor's been great. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Excellent. Will students have to pay for lost fobs? They will. How much will they be charged? Five dollars. Seven dollars. Seven dollars. <laughs> Cards were five. Fobs are seven. <laughs> so they'll get a new one. They'll get an initial one. Yep. Just like safety glasses if they lose them or other things. Yeah. Um, and uh, all that will go through our new assistant principal, uh, Josh Clark, is going to be the one that's going to oversee that side of the house, along with coordinating with central office, who will be able to uh, program them and re reissue. They'll get it immediately, yeah. whether they pay it or not. We'll recoup the funds later on, because yeah. students have to access all the buildings. Yeah. But it, Will the ones that, that is lost be, can it somehow be deactivated? If it's found, yeah, it, it, absolutely. So if it's lost, we're going to really encourage the students, don't worry about the money right now. Yeah. Identify the fact that you lost it so we can disengage you from the system. Okay, great. If it ends up being found yeah. later, we're not going to charge them. Great. And we can trade it back out, we can yeah. take the fob back, yeah. or we can just say keep the one you got, and we can reprogram that one yeah. and make it to someone new. Yeah. yeah. So it won't compromise. The security of it. it's lost and found uh, just the Apple storage the contract is waiting for some some uh, material that he said the engineer structural engineer ordered specified that is not is unique which I don't really understand that um, it just sounds like he's uh, got other jobs he's done <laughs> This, this is a real question. Do you yeah. have a vacation plan uh -huh. in yep. a couple Coming months? Yep. Be yep. careful, don't you? <laughs> like, we got to keep him hanging until you say retirement. No, no vacation. Yes, the answer is? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'd also like to, uh, this time, just take a minute and just to Bianca, I have to say, is our savior all the way around, just like Tim. I mean, he is on every project in the school. He, he is the unsung hero behind this, the scenes. But every time somebody asks a question in a Board of Trustees meeting, he's got an answer. The other thing is in the committee meeting this afternoon, we participated with people that came in in a volunteer capacity to serve on this committee and started to fire questions at some of the vendors that we're working with. And Joe stepped up and neutralized that whole situation to make it palatable for the people that were here in a professional capacity that I felt that some of the volunteers were so out of line that yeah, I, 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 I mentioned to them that I apologized that these people stepped up like they did. And I said, my horoscope this morning said, about diplomacy and I used every bit of strength to hold back and use diplomacy not to go after them but Joe you handled 110 percent perfect so when Andy keeps saying in every discussion our administration team is the best I'd like to give Joe a round of applause Yes, well done, Joe. That was fabulous. He was starting to get a little, a little beyond what should be. So you're on. So I have to admit, um, the, my first narrative there is an error because um, I'm very happy to report that the, um, the governor signed the bill and that school all school meals are free. So I put the notch. So I certainly apologize for, for that error. Um, additionally, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, the drinking water program we have, um, Tim and I have supplied them with the map of where all the um, drinking fountains are. Um, now we're, waiting, we're back waiting for them to come back and work with us some more. Um, 
we have officially rolled out the new state um, conflict of interest. So we rolled it out to all 12 month employees and then um, when all the um, teachers and parents and everybody come back, it will be rolled out for them. This is managed through the state. So it's um, certainly, uh, they manage it, so we kind of will just have to roll it out and that's it. Um, just an update on the credit card status. I did reach out to the city treasurer and the, the first initial um, response two months ago was that it had gotten declined, their request for an increase. So uh, the treasurer was looking into that more. Um, and then today she said she's waiting for more information. So she's hoping to release it. Um, the conflict of interest training, a definite improvement over the previous one, I think. I, I believe so. Yeah, I guess much better. And so exciting that we are providing free lunches to students in the state. What, how much is that saving us a year? Saving us in terms of... Oh, it's not saving us anything because it's self-sustaining. Correct. Yeah. But we're able to... Um, yeah. Heather's, um, you'll see when I request the contracts for the cafeteria, it's definitely increased because she has more, she, she's serving more students with breakfast and lunch. Gotcha. Any of the a la carte items, they do have to pay for it. Yeah. But at least uh, we're not looking at students um, or challenges. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so great. That definitely is. Um, so we're certainly, um, by the September report, uh, September meeting, I'll be able to report on all of FY23 once the city auditor um, rolls all, all of the balances. Um, the, it's hard to believe that um, the end of year report is due on September 29th. Um, so we just received that from Jesse. Um, and additionally, the um, invoices, just a um, reminder that the way when the FY23 was closed, was closed on July 6th, which did not give as a time for uh, the vendors to even provide us with invoices. So I'm hoping maybe next month what might be the last month that we have invoices tripling from having to have you approve them. So here is an updated copy um, of them with the accounts that will be paying for. Sending districts in, in monies coming in, how, how is that? Perfect. Everything was received in FY23. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, under new business, <clears throat> may I have a motion and a second to approve for discussion slash possible action vote to move to an electronic process of approval of warrants? Second. Is there any discussion? I'd like to make some. Uh, in regards to this was brought up last month, and uh, we went around the room and we talked about it. We didn't have some of the people that are here tonight weren't here then. Uh, I feel personally that when the job of trustees that the people were elected to fulfill, part of it was warrants in regards to in person coming in to review them. Assignment. Uh, I still feel that way, and it's part of our job. I feel that um, on a fiduciary position that we are elected officials under the people and the citizens of North Canton that have elected us, expect us to do our job in regards to looking over these invoices, and if something flares up, or is done wrong, or there's a, a problem, the trustees are going to be looked at as the overseers of the school that we didn't do our job. I got a problem with that. And 
I know that you're trying to be expeditious in regards to time manner, uh, getting the warrants signed on a timely fashion, and I know the world's changing in regards to the speed of light to get stuff done. Uh, great, that works in some cases. I'm going back to over a hundred years when this school was founded by Oliver Smith that the intention of the citizens of Northampton in regards to overseers of the Oliver Smith will is that part of that position that it says that every time we have a new school year that comes up that I have to read the statement in regards to the Oliver Smith will, it states in there that the trustees that are elected by the citizens of Northampton oversee the will. Part of the will is the management of the school. I'm the oldest trustee on the board right now. I've been on the board for 13 years. I have a very personal responsibility to the citizens of Northampton and a very personal responsibility to the employees of the school and even more to the students and their parents. So in regards to if you want to expedite this and everybody wants to vote on it tonight, I'm just putting down on my record that I vote no. Thank you. Can I ask, since I wasn't here, I apologize at the last meeting, just ask some clarifying questions. So this is just to, this is for for signing warrants like MPS does or, you know, or like doc, doc, you know, contracts that I sign on DocuSign, is that right? So is it any different than the paper copy you would get? Or is, I mean, I assume the warrant would, would provide all the information on the digital copy, right? No. I what, what you don't get, Mayor Gina, is the backup. It's my understanding, correct? correct? We will not receive copies we of We will not pieces. receive the, the backup, okay? All you'll get is the printout of, what, the vendor identification number? Does it even have the vendor's name? Yes, it does. Okay, the vendor's name and amount. So you don't know what the money's being spent on. It doesn't have a, a narrative or a description? It doesn't have a small narrative, yes, it does. Okay, so it, it tells you the vendor and the, the amount, amount and then what number. the expenditure is for. It's a small description, correct. Okay. Um, so in the actual paper copy, there'd be like a scope of service or something else? You get the it? actual invoice. Right, but if the information is on the... But as an example, so culinary runs out of a bunch of ingredients, so they have to run a big lie. So the report would be big lie, the amount, the account number, tying it back to culinary, and probably a short description, probably. Kitchen it's a description, yeah. But it wouldn't be a box of salt sugar. and flour yeah. and sugar and milk, and it wouldn't have all of that. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I feel like one of the remarkable things that the pandemic brought us was allowing, um, you know, some of some things that always had to be signed in person to be able to be signed online. I actually find that I can spend more time with digital documents than I, if someone puts me a stack of stuff in front of me and they're standing there, I, you know, there's a lot of pressure to read through all of those. I find it much harder to process that information than if I'm opening up a document, I can like scan things. And I find things all the time um, that, I, that I then ask questions about or ask for a revision on. Um, and I find it actually a lot easier to do that um, digitally, you know, when I can than if I'm standing there and expected to, to process a whole chunk of things very quickly. Can I ask a question regarding your tenure here? Um, how long has it been? January eight years. Eight, how many? Eight years. Wow. So in those eight years, um, can you identify how many instances a trustee looking at the itemized receipts or the actual invoices has changed a warrant or changed the approval of a warrant. Like I'm, I'm wondering how important the actual, like 
So trustee looking at those, does it change the outcome? Has it changed in your eight years? Has it ever changed the outcome? No, if, if anything, it just, I, um, they will ask questions and I just defer the answers. Um, so I want to say one other thing, which is at the last meeting, um, I am definitely in favor of it. I think that, you know, Crystal is our school business administrator who's been hired to do her job and she is recommending this to us. I think the public schools do this, the city does it. Um, but in the last month or so, I think, Rick, you were um, out of town. So I got called a lot <laughs> to come in and sign the warrants. And so I'm feeling like if the two of you really, it's really important to you to sign the warrants and if the majority votes to do it in person, that, you know, I don't, I don't want to have to be constantly asked. I'm working a lot. It's hard for me to stop what I'm doing and get over here and sign it. Because that's part of your job. Part of your job. And I'm to happy to do it I have an opportunity to do it electronically, which is, is won't change <clears throat> my practice. I don't when I come in to sign the warrant, I don't look through every single invoice. I'll scan exactly what's on the top, the description is done. Okay. If you want to call it for a vote, we can do it, but I'd ask to have it pulled. Is there any more discussion on it? Does anybody have more to say? Well, uh, I have something to say. I, I'm going to have to abstain at this point because I can't make a decision. Can I abstain? Can I do that? So you can move forward and have a vote, but I, I will uh, abstain at this time. Call for a vote. Poll, please. Mr. Kaling? No. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Yes. Mr. Quadro? Abstain. Mayor Ciara? Yes. Dr. Bonner? Yes. Ask one more question, um, Crystal. At any point, if a trustee has questions about the warrants, if they, it sounds like they will be sent to us electronically. Yeah. If I want to see an itemized receipt for any, or the actual invoice for any warrant that we've approved, am I able to do that yes. with you? You keep these on file? Correct. I can yes. come in any time and look through all of them. Okay. Can I pose a question? Uh, now that it's been approved, I just want to make sure, speaking on behalf of Crystal, the, the practice of this now, um, how would the board recommend this practice move forward? So currently there's the requirement, past practice was two signatures, now that will be electronic. Does the board want to identify two trustees that this will be sent to for the two OKs? Does the board prefer having this go out as we do with contracts? You get an email from me, I send it to all of you. Uh, do you prefer that the warrant goes to all five of you and the first two that respond, that's considered approval? I, just, I think the board needs to decide how it's, how it's going to carry through. I will add to that conversation discussion. I, I, I would suggest that goes to everybody, and like Dr. Andy suggested, the, Whoever responds the quickest, I guess, approves it. And if anybody else has a question, they reach out to Crystal and say, hey, I want to see this one. Can you provide more detail? I think that would work for me. I like that idea also. And just for one more clarification, if I do receive two approvals and then someone after the fact requests a copy of an invoice, mm -hmm. just know that that has already processed yeah, it's that. just okay. it's just yep. clarification. Absolutely. Like you know, when I first started, I was asking questions all mm -hmm. the time. Absolutely. And you said that you've never changed warrants because of questions about an invoice. So when we, there's a process that we have in the business office to go through the warrants yeah. just be, before they come to me, yeah. because then when they, after I sign them, and as well as you, it goes down to the auditor's office, which they go through them as well. Yeah. So. So the fact that it, it can be approved and somebody still might have questions, that hasn't, questions before it was approved, didn't change it, right. uh, so it probably won't happen. Right. 
Okay, the next one may have a motion to second to approve payment of the FY23 invoices listed in the financial report. So moved. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion to second to approve to amend the 23-24 school calendar, the <coughs> last day of school changed to June 13th, 2024. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. I'll, I'll just get the yeah, uh, framework for the board. <coughs> but so this agenda item was placed on the, on the agenda because uh, after the school calendar was approved at the spring time by the board, uh, we realized and actually we were notified because of MCAS. Uh, the MCAS dates were modified slightly because of the, uh, pr the presidential primary in April. We failed to recognize that and add it to the school calendar. So tonight's agenda was to add in the primary in March or April, March. whatever whatever date it happens to be, which then from the board's perspective, it would push day number 180, the last day of school, to Thursday, June 13th. So that was the motion uh, that you're, you're looking for. Now, earlier today, uh, I was informed uh, that Northampton is not having a primary in September. We also on the school calendar that was approved, we have a primary date already locked in in September where there's not going to be a school uh, a school day then. So I, I pose that to the board. Uh, we can keep the primary, the alleged primary day in September as a non-school day. And then by adding the Super Tuesday primary in March uh, to the school calendar, that would make the last day of school uh, June thir uh, 13th, and that's prior to any snow days. Uh, if the board wants to discuss and perhaps pull back the, the non-school day in September, uh, because there is no election, we could have a school day that day, uh, and then add the Super Tuesday day in March, then the last day of school would stay the same, it would be a wash. It would still be uh, Wednesday the 12th at this point, again, before any snow days. What is your preference? Yeah, I'd have to defer to the leadership team. I, I, speaking as an individual, um, I would say let's get rid of the, the day in September and keep the last day of school. But I do fear adults with uh, families. I, I, I worry about the families and, and our students who maybe have already made plans. And, you know, that's my, my concern. But they don't know that about that September. But they, they don't. Sorry. They, they received the they, school yeah, they, should, they should know the school calendar. Most uh, are we unusual in having that day off, having school closed on that day? Being an election site, polling site. If if schools are used for polling sites, it's a more common practice now to have no school to deal with school security. Um, if towns don't use schools as a, a polling site, then there's no need for school. I'm just thinking, like, how much would we be in line with the central district's school calendars in, in terms of family plans that may have been NPS has school that day, right? I think we are. We do. I have to double check that. I was just going to ask, is North, what's Northampton doing as um, far as their calendar? Regardless of what's decided, how do we solve this for next time? Because that, whether there's going to be a summary or not, is, it can't be known until right. July. Mm -hmm. So. So every couple of years it's going to be an issue. Right. right. It always has been. There's always been no school on preliminary day, even if there's no. Well, I mean, on. if there was uh, here, there usually yeah. has been a primary. Yeah. Just, I would just keep it. Right just be <laughs> done with it. My opinion, I would just keep it and be done with it. Do you have a preference, Joe? I, I'm in line with Dr. Lincoln with regard. I, I think Andy makes a fair point. I don't know what medical appointments or other things people have scheduled in anticipation of, the, of that being. Yeah. A non school day. Um, in big picture, I'm just looking at June uh, just to give the board a, a perspective of if we go to the 13th compared to the 12th. Again, the 13th is a Thursday. We have to assume living in New England, we're going to have a few snow days. Most likely, that, that's going to put us into the following week at some point. Mm -hmm. Now, following week, Wednesday is Juneteenth, so that would automatically be a non school day then. Mm -hmm. But my point is, we, we have a buffer of five days or so that we could play with, with potential snow days. Um, then we get into the final week of June. Uh, that final week is our typical Connecting for Success conference for many of our teachers and administrators. 
it gets more hairy when we start getting into that final week of June. But at this point, even if we keep the September day as a non-school day, we add the new primary day in March, that means we finish up on June 13th, and then we add snow days, we still have a week of a buffer uh, before we're really stressing out. Just for a point of information, so uh, NPS is in, in session. Okay. We're in session. Was Unit D asked what they went for? We just found out about this this afternoon. So At 3 o'clock, I found out. So maybe just, well, I guess we can't because we have the meeting now. But just to see if they have a strong preference one way or the other to factor that in to the decision. Well, uh, North Haven Public Schools is having a school. I think we should have a school. But they're saying they want to have to keep the day off. No, I know. Because uh, people have already made plans. But have they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. No. Maybe in two years when these other calendar, we can say, if needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We would know that it's not a good issue. Yeah. So I, I would advocate for leaving it to the administrative leadership team to decide and, and cons checking in with the with unity first to, to see what teachers want. You're going to judge that and then decide from there. Just back there. I agree. Do you need a right. motion? I would ask for a motion on the vote to authorize a <coughs> superintendent. Yeah, I make a motion to authorize Superintendent Lincoln Holker to make a decision on the September 13th date. Yes or no? September 19th. Uh, 19th. Excuse me. Second. All in favor? Aye. Wait, is there Aye. discussion? Joe, Joe. Just point of information for the board. That should include allowing Andy to, Andy to designate the final day of school. Yes. Yes. Sure. Because yep. it has to. It has to. That falls yeah. under your right. purview. So it just so that the motion has that. Yes. Yeah. Right there to the motion. We better redefine the motion, Chairman. You can take it as a amendment. Amendment. Amendment to the motion. You have that done. Okay. Dr. Lincoln, how will you let us know what you decide to make a Definitely. Thank you. Okay. All right. Just need to move on. Need to vote on it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <coughs> a motion to second to approve and amend policy IKF graduation requirements to increase graduation requirement credit to six beginning with the class of 2027. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? I, I think oh, you want to have uh, Just uh, if you have any questions on the document that I prepared, the vote it really should be to increase it by six, not two six. It would go from 150 to 156 okay. uh, credits, and that is to account for what has traditionally been the pre-explore exploratory time that didn't appear on a report card or transcript. Do you want to just provide a little bit more context for um, the full board, uh, specifically the policy, the problem that's being addressed with the policy? Sure. Um, if you did have time to review the rationale um, that was sent out, and you have any questions, I can answer those. But the sort of the Cliff Notes version um, is that this is going to allow for that time now to be uh, graded. It will appear on the report card. It will appear on the transcript. Um, and that will allow students, there's, there's a myriad of reasons that I, I listen to the rationale, but I um, uh, want to make sure that those students are, have that time accounted for as time on learning and that it's graded. Um, we also don't want to, we also want to make sure that students aren't necessarily going to, in looking back at our data, most of the students are not going to be failing this. Um, so not that it's a formality, but it's, it, it is in a way to formally recognize that they did this time, that they passed it, uh, and that they will receive credit for it. Um, Question. Yes, sir. Um, I was expecting you to say, possibly say not taking the exploratory seriously and goofing off on some of them. I, I think that's a byproduct of this. I think any time that, um, anytime that you are going to be on record, uh, that is definitely going to be a behavior management yeah. uh, tool that the school can use and staff can use so they do take those opportunities more seriously. 
Um, and I think a byproduct of that is by taking it more seriously, you may actually realize that you enjoy that area or you right. like that area. Uh, another big thing that I think is going to, to um, Dr. Spencer Robinson's point is it's going to allow us to, in real time, through the Redditor system, the parent portals and the steward portals for them to see how they're doing in those shops as they progress through them. And we're hoping that it's going to allow for uh, better conversations out of our school counselor's office <clears throat> with parents and families. Uh, around decision making and at home when they ultimately decide their top four and then they're number one because they are going to be able to see well this is how you've been performing in there are you sure this is really the shop that you're interested in or how do you, why do you see yourself there if this is where you scored so uh, and then ultimately honestly you know sometimes Smith is not for everyone uh, and this will allow us to really have those conversations earlier with students and families about their progress because we can we have real data now about how they're performing on the vocational side of the house, which is the point of being here. So, the rationale is super detailed um, and appreciated. It does include the teacher perspective, <coughs> and I wonder if you could speak to a little bit if teachers are seeing this as as a little bit onerous, where it, it increases their workload, where now they've got to track student learning and understand rubric and, and comply with it, mm -hmm. um, or are they supportive of this? Um, and if so, why? Yeah, a lot of the instructors have been pushing for this for several years now with us. So we formed a committee um, with using Perkins funds. Um, it's kind of been something that we've done now for about five years. Every year, try to form a committee to look at something to improve or to fix a problem, come up with a solution for it. Um, a lot of staff on the vocational side have looked at this and said, uh, we really should be grading this. We really should be tracking this. Um, Academic teachers have also stepped forward. <clears throat> There's been a lot of discussion with the academic department heads uh, around incorporating a daily grade um, that mirrors the expectations on the vocational side of the house. Um, so we formed a committee that had both vocational and academic teachers on it, as well as administrators and school counselor. And the hope is that the rubrics that are part of your packet, one was already uh, created the year before when we reevaluate our existing rubric, which we did again this year. Uh, and our student services director, Rebecca Wanzik, is always part of that, uh, looking at it, making sure that it's staying up to date with what our needs are and as well as the needs of the students. But, you know, hopeful was that um, we sort of packaged it in a different way. Uh, where we kind of looked at the four P's, preparedness, punctuality, participation, performance, and that, that's something that the academics can incorporate as their daily grade uh, to look at also. So that was there. Um, we've developed a system that I don't think is going to be onerous. They're already evaluating the students and looking at them. Uh, anyway, I think if anything, this is going to help us move from an anecdotal idea of how students are doing to uh, to actual data-driven. Data -driven. Data -driven. Yeah. Um, and we're going to do it in a low-tech way uh, that is going to allow for the teachers to be able to fill up the rubrics throughout the day, evaluate students, hand them in, and have the school counselors do the data entry and be the official um, teacher of record on their exploratory experience. Yes. So sure. I'm hearing you say it was really almost teacher-driven and you're responding to that interest in creating this really kind of systematic approach. I appreciate especially the um, the the line that your that this policy is walking, where it's um, it's pass fail it doesn't count towards the GPA and audit. Well, it just seems exactly right for an exploratory experience where this is going to count. This matters. Your teachers are going to be looking at you, but it's not going to have long term damage. Hold on. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to approve to surplus for Oh, sorry. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to approve to surplus for a donation of medical exam table in good working condition from the adult education program. Thank you. Second. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. And may I ask our young lady up here to address the comment? Recommendation of the manager. 
Oh, in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.